my introduction here to say, if you were reading along, this is a really great opportunity to help employers uh, answer the questions that I often hear posed, which is when I bring students on campus, on my campus, how do I make sure that they're properly insured? How do I make sure that I'm managing risk for my company? And we've got two wonderful speakers. Matt Zender, we're going to start with you. As you if you were reading the slide as I was doing the introduction, um, a true expert, a speaker, a presenter in conferences around the world, uh, involved in many state and local boards, national boards. Uh, Matt, we're just thrilled to have you here. Thanks, Larry. Um, you want me to start? You want me to jump on in? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay. So, you know, I started, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you today. I'm not, I don't have any slides. I know Melissa has a couple toward this, the back half of this, but, you know, I started in workers' compensation about 30 odd years ago. And my, I was 21 years old, got on a plane, ended up in Atlanta, Georgia, and I did five weeks of training. And I think, uh, you know, I think Larry, that was probably two Braves stadiums ago. Um, they, they've moved a couple of times since then when I was, so it's been a while. Um, but so I, I guess what, in a way that was kind of a work-based learning approach that I was taking back then, you know, right out of college and, and learning an industry. I, I, I want to start today with a couple of um, sort of building block items that, that many of you may know, but they're, they're going to be important that we have some basis of understanding as we talk about some of the other items that we go through here. The first one is just sort of what is work comp? And I, I know you know what it is, but let's talk about how it started. And it, it basically it started as a, about 100 years ago as a, a grand bargain between businesses and employers. If you think about it, it's, it was basically an approach to, to give a little, get a little, take a little. Um, and prior to that, it was just a tort system. You, if you got injured, you sued your employer and you either won a lot or most likely you lost. And, um, you know, it was it was. It was going to be based on um, you know, negligence and things like that. And, and it was just a, a poor system. And it left a lot of people who deserve to be taken care of with little recourse. And so it was kind of kicking around for a while in the early 1900s. And there was some debate about whether or not it was how it was going to work. And in, in March of 1911, there was a thing called the Triangle Fire. Uh, Triangle Fire was in New York. And it was basically three stories in the garment district of New York. Um, and what happened is someone threw a, a cigarette in a bin and they had two months worth of clippings in this bin and that started a fire. That in and of itself might not have been too problematic, except for the fact that the doors had been locked. And they did this both in, in order to manage the, the hours that people were working and also to prevent theft. But this um, led to just a, a, a disastrous situation when folks realized the fire was taking place and they were trapped. And so what happened is 146 people died, uh, many of them uh, as they tried to jump out of the building because they had no other way to get to the, to the stairs. This event, as, as terrible as it was, led people to realize that we needed a new sort of work comp system. And that's how the grand bargain came about. So that's, a, that's the, the one piece that we sort of understand in terms of, you know, you know why do I even need this? And, and it's important to think about you know, the, the grand bargain is a piece of that. The second part that's important as we think about, you know, ensuring apprentices and work-based learners is um, how does it get priced? Um, and, and this is going to be important as we talk about some of the other pieces coming up. So it really, in order to price a work comp policy, all we really need is, is what do you do? Um, how much do you pay them? And where are you located? And after that, the rest of it's just details. Uh, the, the what do you do? helps us set the class code that's going to be involved. The how much do you pay? Uh, it, you know, payroll is the exposure basis for workers' compensation. And the where you located is mostly relevant uh, in terms of the state that you're in. In this case, we've got mostly a Georgia-based audience. But each state is different in terms of how they, they, they structure their workers' compensation approach. And so that's going to be important for those of you involved in HR and recruiting the fundamental issues that I'm talking about here are going to be the same across all states, but there are some peculiarities that Georgia has that, that are different. And I'll, I'll try and highlight those as I, as I go through this. 
but so so really you know you have from a pricing perspective you have your class code that gets multiplied by the payroll um, and then you have the the state factors that come in and then there's something called a loss cost multiplier in georgia um, and that loss cost multiplier varies um, by carrier uh, the class code rates vary by class code. So you have, you know, differences in terms of what do you do? I know a lot of you are involved in manufacturing. And so you have specific rates based on what type of product you're manufacturing. On top of all of that, you overlay your experience mod. Some people call it your X mod, some people call it an E mod. Um, and this is where I'm gonna try and bring it back to younger workers because the experience mod absolutely is influenced by the things that happen traditionally with what we see with younger workers, mostly positively. Uh, also, there are a couple of instances where, where we have some things that we need to pay attention to. So, <clears throat> you know, the experience mod, I suspect most of you are aware of it, but it's a formula. Uh, and that basically takes a look at how are you doing versus your um, other businesses that are in the same class code. And, the, and Unity would be 100 or 1.0. And if you have operate um, per the formula uh, more safely, uh, then you get a credit experience mod. If you, uh, if you operate per the formula less safely, in other words, you have more claims um, and more severe claims, then you get a debit mod. Um, it's important to know that the formula contemplates debit mods, um, or it contemplates severity and frequency. And that's something that I'm gonna talk about a little bit. Um, when, when we get to that point. So, you know, the, it, it, what that means is, you know, like if you have a lot of medium-sized claims, that's actually probably going to be worse for your experience mod than if you have one really, really big claim. If you have one really, really big claim, there are caps that are involved in order to make sure that the, a fortuitous loss or a loss that, that maybe you had no control over, but is really, really bad, um, that won't just blow you out of the water. Again, taking us back to this grand bargain, they created a system so that it would incentivize employers to want to make sure that they had workers' compensation in place. Obviously, it's also required to have it in place, so they wanted to create it in a way that it wasn't gonna to be too punitive. So now, as we, as we move ahead, let's, let's talk about a couple of key items here. Are younger workers covered? Um, why should you hire them? And why is there such a bias against hiring younger workers? And I'll probably start with that last one first. Um, the, the bias against hiring younger workers, um, I, we can understand it. There's complicating factors. But I think mostly it's, it's based in the fact that the Accord application, which is the standard set of questions that the industry has used for years and years and years, the Accord application um, contained a, co a couple of questions. And, it, and one of them was, do you have any employees under the age of 16 or over the age of 60? Um, and, and also ask whether you have any employees with disabilities. Both of those questions, you know, when, when shined through a, a lens of, of 2022, both of those questions are kind of archaic. I think we can realize that, that they're problematic uh, from a legal perspective as well. But they've sort of set the bias. I mean, they, for years and years, I think people said to themselves, well, geez, I mean, the Accord app is asking if I have any of these younger workers, so that must mean they're terrible. Um, and it simply was not the case. I, I think it, the reason they asked the question decades ago was not steeped in younger workers are bad. It was just steeped in trying to help illustrate the overall age range of the employees who were involved. So because this question has been asked forever and ever, and agents are familiar with it, and everybody's sort of used to that question, I think it sort of set the bias. Now let's ask our you know, that are younger workers covered? Uh, it really comes down to the definition of employment status. And there's, I know a lot of you are in HR, so you know that, you know, there are three main types of employment statuses. You're going to really be a, an employee, you're going to be an independent contractor, or you're going to be a volunteer. Um, and so are you paying these people is going to be a really key question. Um, if the answer is yes, then most of the rest of this dialogue just centers on whether or not these workers are working for you in a safe manner. And I'll have a couple comments on that. If the answer is no, then you're probably falling into a volunteer status. Um, and 10, 
the volunteers are excluded in 10 states, but Georgia is not one of them. Um, so you can simply add a voluntary compensation endorsement onto the policy. It's if you are if you have people who aren't getting paid for what they're doing, um, and typically what you would then do with that is so it's a, it's a good thing to add anyways because it's going to help resolve coverage issues down the line. But if you have that endorsement, basically what would happen is when you come around to the time where you're going to audit the policy, all policies are subject to a premium audit at the end of it. You're going to try and find a job that was comparable. So if you have uh, let's say you have three people who are working for you as volunteers and three people who are working for you as employees uh, because they may be younger and they just started, but they're actual employees. Um, you, you basically would just look to see what the comparable job is and what you're paying them. And then you would ask how many hours am I, are these volunteers working for me? And you would factor that in as payroll. Doing that will make sure that you resolve any coverage issues down the line. Independent contractors is probably not something that we're talking about in this context because we're really talking about apprentices and work-based learners. But just know that, you know, the independent contractor status comes down to care and control. Um, and if you've got somebody who is, you know, truly an employee of somebody else and you, in your role, do not exercise any care or control over them, then they're going to be an independent contractor and they're not your problem. Um, just make sure that you're pulling their certificate of insurance to make sure that they do have insurance somewhere else. Okay, so if you've got, if you're, if you're bringing them in from a third party, just get their cert and it's not a problem. They'll give it to you. And um, you, you're not going to have to worry about any exposure there. Let's talk about why you should hire younger workers. There's a lot of reasons, honestly. One of them is, and I'm only half joking when I say this, but when they're young, I, I'm pretty sure that, that, uh, until the age of 25, these people are made of rubber. Um, I, I think they can just bounce up and from any almost any injury and brush it off and they're fine. Um, and I'm kidding, but I, my point is, is that frankly, injuries don't affect younger people the same way that they do older. And we can see it in the data. Um, there is a, a really an imbalance between the, the, the frequency and severity. Um, younger people have more claims but they aren't as severe. Why do they have more claims? Um, well, they're just less familiar with, with, what, they're, uh, with what they're doing. Um, and, and anybody who's less familiar with what they're doing is going to be more likely to have a claim. Uh, we, we see this in the data. Um, in fact, over the last 40 years, frequency of claims has dropped um, with one exception, and that was in the year 2010. And that was just because the, the, the great employment rush that happened following the Great Recession. So following the Great Recession in 2007, 8, 9, we opened back up and we hired people and these people didn't know what they were doing. That's not an age comment, that's an experience comment. And they had more claims. So by virtue of the fact that, you know, younger people have less experience, they're gonna be more likely to have a claim. They just don't know their way around. They, they lack context in certain things. Um, I'll talk about that further in, in one more minute here. Um, but they, they just don't have, the, the claims that happen just don't affect them as severely. Secondly, they have um, access to medical care. So most, certainly if they're still a student, uh, most universities are going to um, make certain that they have health care in place or they will provide it for them. Um, and they've got great uh, medical facilities on campus. I'm not suggesting that a work comp claim should be handled through private medical care. That's not at all what I'm saying, but there are instances where it's a little gray. Um, and there are instances, well, I think I might've tweaked my back a little bit at work, but yeah, I played baseball yesterday and hurt a little bit there too. And I don't know. And, and then they, they, you know, the fact that they have access to their parents' medical care or the university or other medical care means that these individuals, this cohort, if you will, is going to have access to care that some other folks wouldn't. Um, you know, if you, you know, so if you put same medical situation in front of a 20-year-old um, and a 45-year-old, A, it's going to, you know, act differently because of the age difference, and B, it's going to act differently because of access to care. 
Secondly, why you should hire younger workers, frankly, all of you in HR and recruiting are acutely aware of the labor shortage that's going on. Um, it's, it, it is, uh, you know, it's pretty um, noticeable. It varies by industry, um, but most manufacturing industries are seeing an aging workforce right now. Um, so if you're in the manufacturing space, you're definitely in tune to the fact that, um, you know, we've got a great in workforce. I was looking at some research the other day, uh, people that are about age 55 or greater, 50.3 of those people are now retired as of the third quarter 2021. That's up from 48.1 in the third quarter 2019. Between 2008 and 2019, the retired population, age 55 and older, grew by over a million retirees every year. But in the last two years, it's grown by 3.5 million. Um, and, and so, and that number is even higher for those people that have college degrees. So in other words, the number of people who are over 55 who are pulling themselves out of the workforce is clearly expanding. And so all the more reason that we need to find younger workers who can help support us and, and, um, and move into these spaces. So I mentioned some of the, the, the why you should hire them. And, and again, these are, these are broad brush strokes and each of them are gonna be a little different for you and your situation. But what are some of the downsides? I mean, it's not all perfect. Um, there are some things that you need to look out for, uh, some things to pay attention to, and then you can help make sure that this is going to be a positive experience. Number one, I mentioned the fact that new employees have a dramatically higher frequency of claims. So, so you need to keep that in mind. Um, number two, a lot of these people, you know, for them, you know, context, is, context is lacking. They're obviously very smart, um, but without context, certain situations can seem foreign. I'm reminded of a situation that happened to me um, a little bit ago. We had a, a, a friend uh, of ours, their daughter was going through a, um, a graduate program and she needed a place to stay. So she stayed with us and she had a rental car and she needed to drop off this rental car. So my wife took her down to the airport. Um, she went in the parking garage, she dropped off the car, she got into my wife's car and they left. And about an hour later, they got a phone call from the rental car center saying, where's the car? And she was like, what do you mean? I dropped the car off. And, and they said, no, you didn't. Well, it turns out she had just walked into the rental car facility, saw somebody, threw the keys at him and left. Well, the person didn't work for the rental car company whatsoever. And so this person just took off with the car. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. They, they found the car later. It was uh, a lot worse for wear, I will tell you. But the point of it is, she's obviously a very smart person. She's going through a management uh, graduate program. She just lacked a little context in terms of where you would drop off rental car keys. And that same thing happens with, um, with people when they're starting in, you know, in, in new careers. So how do we sort of offset that? I think the main way that you can offset the, some of those, those factors is even if it's a short-term gig, you want to make sure to take some time to make sure that they're oriented. Um, you know, this the onboarding process is extremely important. I know all of you in HR are, are, are in tune with that. But, you know, maybe you wanted to think about not only onboarding in terms of making sure they know where to get their coffee, but onboarding in terms of the, you know, the, the overall safety and, 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 and thinking about it from a, 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 a rear view mirror perspective for work comp. And that way, you know, you can make sure to help them focus on, um, this is really, a, you know, your opportunity to help them make sure they understand what helps separate your firm, what makes you, what makes your firm special. Um, and also it may be their first experience in that industry. So, you know, this is a chance to help, you know, influence their retention, influence career recruitment, things along those lines. So, you know, the onboarding process is something that is, that is really just a critical one. So, you know, from a, from a high level perspective, and I, I hope we'll maybe we'll get a couple of questions as we go through this and, and after Melissa's comments, we'll, we'll be more than happy to take those. But those are some high level questions that are high level points that kind of walk through, you know, overall, you know, why it's a, a good thing to be to be hiring younger workers. I, I'll, I'll summarize it by saying this, you know, I, A, most of the negative comments out there are just biases and they're biases that are steeped in a false um, a, a false basis. I mean, the, the, the asking that question uh, is is um, is antiquated and incorrect, and and it, it just makes people think some of the wrong things. 
um, these younger workers are going to um, have claims. Absolutely, they will have claims. Um, but if you structure your work comp policy, as I, as I pointed out, um, you're going to, you know, the, the claims will come into the system. The, you know, they'll the tend to be less severe on average. And um, the overall productivity that you'll gain will more than offset that. So at this point, I'm, I'm going to pause and I'll, I'll turn it over to Melissa, if I could, Larry. All right. Well, <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Matt. And yes, we'll bring Melissa into the conversation. I'll give you just uh, highlights of Melissa's background, and she'll have a PowerPoint slide she'll share while she speaks. But she is the executive director of Heartland, which is part of the Foothills Education Charter High School system. Um, she has a, a lot of experience in education. I always bow to any math teacher, but she, as you can see, many roles, instructional coach, testing coordinator. I know she's been assistant principal, CTAE director, uh, and even uh, Remarkably, she has accepted a part-time role with the Development Authority of Butts County, Georgia. So she has a unique position of being able to not only uh, represent the education organization, but also has a direct role with the companies in the area that's hopefully going to create even more opportunities for students in that area. So Melissa, I'll stop sharing. You can bring your presentation up and uh, we look forward to your comments. Just a second to share here. Okay, thank you, Larry. And thanks everyone for allowing me a few minutes to speak to you. As Larry said, I met him through my role as the existing uh, industry and workforce development coordinator for the Butts County Development Authority. And during our conversation, it came up that I also serve as the executive director of Heartland, which is a division of Foothills Education Charter High School. And Larry invited me to share a few moments about what Heartland is because some of the things we're talking about, those young workers are right in line with what Foothills does. So I'm gonna take a few minutes and tell you a little bit about us. Um, <clears throat> Foothills has a mission and that is to provide opportunities for non-traditional students to earn a Georgia accredited high school diploma and participate in post-secondary options such as college, career and or military so they can improve their lives in the communities in which they live. So the big question is, what is a non-traditional student? And that is a student who has or will drop out of high school. Any of our students are overaged and undercredited. What I mean by that is we may have a 19 year old that's designated as a ninth grader because of the number of credits that they need. So our job, you know, we want to do two things. We want to get them an accredited high school diploma, but we also want to prepare that student for work because at 19, we hope we can get you through the educational process and then on into either post-secondary with college and our career. As you can see, we are accredited just like any other high school in the state of Georgia. So they do get a, an accredited diploma. It is not a GED. There are three schools in the state of Georgia that address this dropout problem across our state. One is Mountain Education Charter High School. It's been in operation for 25 years. The other one is Foothills Education Charter High School, and we've been in existence for since 2015. And then we have Coastal Plains Education Charter High School, and they came on board in 2017. And you see in red there, Heartland, a division of Foothills. And I wanna show you a little bit more using the map. If you look at our map here, we have in the green is your Mountain Ed that I talked about. Foothills is in blue. Down at the bottom in the orange, that's gonna be Coastal Plains. And right in the center of the state is what we are calling Heartland, a division of Foothills. Right now that's made up of two sites at Butts and Bibb. And we hope to be able to fill in more of these counties with red as time goes on. We would like to have a site in as many counties as possible because the opportunity that we provide for these students who, like I said, are they're just non-traditional for whatever reason. You also see purple and we have sites in three state prisons and we also work with the Youth Challenge Program. So what makes us different and why are we an option for students who a non-traditional school does not work for? As I said, many of our students have either dropped out or will drop out. And there's numerous reasons why that happens. 
Um, but some of them is simply our students need to work during the day and need the option at night. So we operate an evening school from four to nine, Monday through Thursday. Another option is that we have year round enrollment, which basically means a student can enroll at any time and they can also finish at any time. We do have graduations, but our students can go ahead, earn their diploma and come back for a graduation ceremony. But they, if they earn a diploma in February, they get that diploma so they can move on to those post-secondary options. Another thing that we offer is a mentorship program. Every one of our students has a mentor and we work with that student, not only the education side, but on anything that they're doing. We want them to be successful. Um, so that, that mentor follows up with those students at least once a week to work with them and see what, you know, what may be the problems, what they need, how we can help them. <laughs> A little bit about where we are currently with Foothills. In this year alone, we've graduated 154 students. Over the time since we opened in 2015, we've graduated 1,664 students. And you'll find that important when I show you uh, something in a moment. And then currently we're serving 2,854 students. So, what do we do? What is our state impact? You all know that a high school graduate is going to earn more than a non-graduate. But also, I want you to look down at the bottom. 376 students have graduated within those state facilities, Department of Corrections. And so our job there, we're preparing those students to enter either higher ed or the workforce when they're released. And right now, the return rate for our students who have received the uh, diploma is extremely low. <clears throat> also, how do we help communities? What are our impact? Of course, students who drop out of school count against local high school's graduation rate. So if we can get a student to enroll with us and complete their diploma, it helps the graduation rate for our partner schools. But also, we work with the community to create job opportunities for students. And I want to show you some of those options. You can see we have the we have a well ready program that we work with the Northeast Georgia Regional Commission on, and this is a ten week program. So far, we went through four classes, and we have our fifth and sixth class going on right now. But forty one students have graduated from this program, and many of them have been offered opportunities. Uh, you can see some of the business there, employers that have worked to employ our students. So we're real excited about that, and I think. When Larry and I talked about this, it's like, okay, how do I fit in with the insurance? Well, because it is my desire, as well as everyone at Foothills, we want our students to have opportunities. And a lot of our students are older, and they are in a position to be able to work. So these opportunities that we're coming up with, we're being very creative. You can see we have a machine-ready class at Athens Tech. Um, <clears throat> that class began in October. And so we hope again, it's an eight week class and we're gonna start again. Well, actually we started another one in January. So we hope we'll be able to have some students find work from there. Um, another opportunity is culinary arts program and that's a CTA class we offer at our um, Jackson site. Healthcare, we have an EMT classes that have gone on in Madison, Clark and Oglethorpe. And then my area here is in Butts County, we started a Heartland Entrepreneurial program and basically what that is it's a work-based learning opportunity but we have worked with local businesses and we have a partnership in agreement um, our students who participate in this must participate in class once a week where they work with our work-based learning coordinator and learn about using the Georgia best curriculum and then they um, go out and they actually use what they've learned apply what they've learned to businesses and we have like a local restaurant here is Zaxby's they hire a lot of our students, but it's not just putting them on that front line getting orders. They're also showing them behind the scenes of what it means to run a Zaxby's company. Um, another opportunity that we're working on really hard is we work with local businesses here in Jackson, along with Jackson High School and the Development Authority, and we're trying to start a welding program here in Jackson because that's what our local businesses said they need is welders. So we're all working together in partnership to see if we can use the lab at Jackson High School to begin the program. And then all of our students, as well as people in the community that are currently working in these businesses but don't have a welding opportunity, can come and, and <clears throat> see 
Uh, what I mentioned earlier I wanted to show you was that think about the number of graduates we've had this year and then overall the number of graduates. The data says that 40% of those graduates are going into full-time employment and 38% of them are going to a college and two-year technical school. So most, most of our students either are going right to work or seeking technical degrees. So it does fit in with what you're talking about, Larry, and what Matthew just talked about is providing those opportunities because we have students that are seeking ways to start learning what it means to go into career and then come out and actually go into career. Um, there are also other opportunities House Bill 402, which the Department of Education came up with, where it does give a tax credit to uh, workers' compensation insurance. And I know, Matthew, you could probably explain that much better than I. Um, I know there's a lot of my partners, great promise partnership people on this uh, webinar this afternoon. And we've been in conversation with them uh, because their program allows us to expand, expand work-based learning opportunities for the type of student I just spoke about that. 19 year old who's not an 11th or 12th grader but might be a ninth grader. So that would expand opportunities for them. There's also your economic development partnership out there that where schools, uh, the economic development and business communities can work together to better align and provide opportunities. And then I guess the big word here is creativity. And Foothills has been, been that as well as the other three schools from day one. We're, we're being creative in everything we're doing. We're always looking for opportunities for our kids. And so, you know, we want our name out there to say if anybody has an idea or want to share. Many of you may have heard of Irene Munn. She heads up a lot of these opportunities you saw for us. And we're interested to work with partners to help our students. And last, I just want to share the name of our superintendent, which is Dr. Sherry Gibney Sherman. We have a regional office in Athens. And then also myself, which I, you saw on the map, I work with Butts and Bia but also with Irene very closely to, like, to help with opportunities that might come up. And that's all I had, Larry. All right, well, if you could, Melissa, if you, there you go, thank you. And, and I think we're of the size that uh, we can raise our hand uh, or it, we'll try that. If you look under uh, your menu, you can see reactions. And if you click the little buttons, on my screen, it's a little smiley face. You can raise your hand if you see how I, I, you should be able to see that hand raised in my window. Uh, we'll recognize you and you can just state your question for either Matt or Melissa. Uh, and while we give you a chance to find that, Melissa, I wanted to ask you a very specific question. And that is when you talk to employers uh, and they ask about insurance, what what kind of questions have you fielded uh, to help ensure to, to help companies know that they're fully covered? Um, quite honestly, Larry, I have to say we ha that has not occurred that much for us. Um, but we have had one major employer that did you know just, just was not interested in working with us. Again, the House Bill four hundred two is something that we put out there, um, and I will say that. Um, there, the Laurie Boswell, who is the CTA director at the DOE, I've uh, been in contact with her and she's going to help. I think all work-based learning coordinators learn more about that so they can um, offer up information. Um, <clears throat> another thing is uh, being creative. And I have learned from some of our fellow uh, sites, like I said, we partner with school districts. So we're not out there doing our own thing. We're only going to communities if we're invited. We don't have buildings or anything like that. So like in Butts County, we use the high school. When the high school students go home, our students go in. So I learn a lot from the high schools themselves. And, um, you know, one of our CTA director in one of our local partnerships explained that they had some students going into a hospital and they were going in under volunteer like Matt talked about. So they were able to just get a policy um, through the school system to help out there. So again, it's creativity. We take it. Whatever comes our way, we're going to investigate and see if there's a way we can help. All right, thank you. So who has a question for Matt or Melissa? If you can raise your hand, we'll recognize you. And if that's not easily figured out, you can just unmute yourself and ask. I mean, it's pretty good.
All right. I'll ask one, Matt, that has been expressed to me more than once from companies, and that is that they have a hiring policy not to hire anyone under the age of 18. And we know that in some cases, child labor laws prevent certain duties from being performed under the age of 18. And there's certain environments when that 18 age is really required. And in some cases, the companies who have that policy could hire people under the age of 18. They just choose not to. Um, so I know you've kind of given your thoughts about why a good reason to consider students uh, who are younger as potential employees. Um, I guess, how often does that come up with, with you and your uh, engagement with companies to help them understand what actually is possible and legal? So the legality of it is really more of an HR issue than it is a work comp issue. So if, if for, in other words, put another way, Larry, if a claim came in for a 17 year old doing something and for a 19 year old doing that same thing, the claim goes down the exact same path. There's nothing about it that would say, oh, you know, you, this is, this person is 17 or 16. Um, so it, what it really comes down to from my perspective is just communication. And, and the better that you communicate with your agent to explain what you're doing and why you're doing it, then it's going to, to remove the downstream issues. So, you know, as I, you know, and my teams, um, as they would underwrite a policy and decide which ones are they going to write, the fact that one may be having 17-year-olds doing something is really not a huge issue for us. It's not like all of a sudden we would move it to the bottom of the list or price it dramatically differently. What would happen is if they were doing that and maybe doing a work-based learning program, but they hadn't communicated any of it to their agent and their agent didn't communicate any of it to us, that again, it, it wouldn't change what happens to that claim. It would change how we view that risk maybe when it comes up to renewal, right? So I just think it comes up to... <clears throat> to communication and the better that, that, that people explain why they're doing what they're doing, most all of these issues can be worked through. All right, thank you. All right, so do we have questions then? Anyone? Yeah, so Lisa, Lisa yeah. you're welcome to unmute and ask your question if you'd like. Larry, can you hear me now? Yes, I do, Lisa. Okay, very good. Um, so, you know, my uh, question and uh, Lil Ray's question that's with me here today would be, you know, we have a corporate hiring policy of 18 or older, so it prohibits us from, uh, you know, participating in the apprenticeship programs where maybe they come in at 16 or 17 and uh, whether it's through a dual program with the technical college or through a career center where, you know, they come their junior and senior year out of high school to us. So, you know, how can we spend this in our project proposal to corporate to uh, at least get the door back open for consideration? And yes, I, I listened to your response when Larry, you just asked that same question. Um, so yeah. I, I need to convince someone that this is really okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the one piece of information that I take a lot of uh, positive uh, out of is we have a child, a child safe labor, child safety uh, expert uh, Jenny Holroyd, who has shared data that shows that students under the age of 18 work safer than students who are 18 and not part of an apprenticeship program. And the reason for that is twofold. Number one, apprentices tend to get a higher level of onboarding, right? Training, supervision, mentorship. Um, that offsets the lack of familiarity with their work processes and maybe work in general. And so 
uh, it's a false sense of security for companies to say, let's just wait till they turn 18 and now they'll be more mature and able to work safely. Because without that orientation uh, to work that Matt uh, described so well, uh, everybody struggles, right? To figure out what to do and how to do it well. So apprenticeship programs just have that built in to where they get more of that uh, support when they get started. And therefore the numbers reflect that they work well and safely. And I can say in five plus years of a German apprenticeship program with over, with well over 50 total uh, participants, we've only had one incident thankfully that didn't result in an injury, but even one incident that we considered reportable. So young workers can work safely. Okay, that, that's, the, that's, very, that's very good. Thank you. Uh, so one of the, go ahead, Melissa. I was just gonna say, you know, I'm not sure exactly what capacity you're thinking about hiring students in, but also if they come in under a work-based learning program, as Larry said, they get a higher level of supervision too. They have that training, they have a training plan that's created and a support system with the work-based learning coordinator that will work with the business and industry to ensure that the student is doing their part and that everyone's doing their part to ensure that that student's safe and all the other components of what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> I, one other comment for Lisa and Lorraine, I, I would say that, and I know you probably realize this as you're thinking about how to stage this for your corporate approach, but I mean, it's just a number, right? I mean, 18 is just a number. And there's probably a more reasonable proxy for that individual's preparedness than their date of birth. Um, there are probably some tests that you can you know, apply, uh, you know, so have them take a, or, or something else that's going to give you a, a better sense. I love Larry's thoughts about using the data itself as a, as a response. What I would do if I were in your position, I'd start with the data and then I would show the tests that we're going to do and then I'd lower the number. Thank you very much. Uh, Larry, if you could share that with me, I would greatly appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. Lisa, I'll just include that in our follow-up to all, okay. all the participants. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Anyone else have a question? loaded question in some ways because you, you've already indicated that it does depend on uh, each company's individual record of performance when it comes to workers' comp and costs. But in on par, if you think about the cost to cover a worker who might be of, of obviously a wide range of ages, what is that incremental cost if you are at the low end of the spectrum, a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old? How does age affect uh, that cost per person, basically? Well, the, the primary way that it affects it, Larry, is, is that since the basis of exposure is payroll, you're on average paying them less. So they're going to cost you less from a work comp perspective. If you started off paying them a million dollars, it's just it's going to be a multiple, you know, so it, it might be $4.82 per $100 of payroll. Well, you pay them a million, it's $4.82 you know, based on a million, you pay them 10,000, et cetera. So it scales and, and, and I think it's by design. Um, so I, I think on average you'll be paying less into work comp because you're paying these individuals less. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So another reason not to discriminate against the younger worker, right? They're likely to be less costly. Yes, and, oh, and by the way, if you are any of you paying them a million dollars to start, Please do get my contact information. I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. All right. Any other questions? We won't belabor it. I appreciate everyone taking time to be part of today. The most exciting thing for me is that we've recorded this. And so we're going to post it on our YouTube uh, channel. We're going to give everyone who registered the link to that. And so when you have this question arise, when companies bring this up as a possible obstacle to them being involved, you'll be able to share what has been learned today 
and hopefully encourage them that it is doable, even if they might get an initial uh, reaction from their current workers' comp carrier that maybe that's something they would prefer to avoid, or maybe there's some indication that there's a problem. Uh, what we've learned is it, it's not, and it can be done, uh, and the costs are uh, perhaps even less than adding workers of older age. So um, Melissa's also obviously given us some great things to think about as far as uh, how Heartland is engaging uh, students, those who dropped out or are at a range of ages, and they have a unique situation where they can work and go to school. And so uh, really hopefully will create some new opportunities uh, for the counties that they serve. So thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Matt, for taking time to be with us today. Uh, we'll end it here. You'll see uh, a follow-up email, hopefully tomorrow, with all the promised information and we just thank you for all that you're doing to encourage more work-based learning uh, throughout Georgia. And we'll be dismissed. So thank you very much. Have a good day. Larry.